Hey guys, John Lexa here, back with our, well, a bonus episode of Hellblade Senwa's Sacrifice. So I basically finished the last episode, um, deleted the game, all that stuff, and then I'm reading other people's reviews, uh, just because I wanted to see what other people thought. Um, when I came across that this, apparently the Hellblade feature is actually a documentary about the making of the game. So I want to go through that today. Uh, it's about 20 minutes, apparently we can watch that together if you don't have the game I mean if or if you want to watch it here there's other places where it's on on YouTube and stuff so if you don't want to watch it here feel free uh, address something real fast uh, just a, a minor correction uh, ninja ninja theory the guys that made this game I was getting them confused with team ninja so team ninja made the ninja Gaiden games ninja theory made obviously this one they made heavenly sword um, enslaved Odyssey to the West, which I liked a lot, actually, even though it's it's got issues as well, but I liked it. Um, and then uh, the Devil May Cry remake, reboot, DMC, that one, they made that. So that's that kind of is a little bit different. It's a little bit interesting. It kind of changes my perception of this because I feel like it actually should be better if the team has done narrative style games before and done them successfully in my mind a little bit complex though this one i mean so just real fast i want to kind of do a little review uh just kind of maybe clarifying my my previous thoughts at the end so i've had about a day to think about it and i still would give the game kind of a meh a neutral right so graphics wise game looks gorgeous looks good i love the environment the setting the norse style stuff i really like that a lot um the audio for the most part is really good um the the environmental sounds fantastic uh voice acting perfect superb great the uh the music the music is okay. I mean, it's technically good, but I feel like it doesn't fit with not all the music. A lot of it, like the like softer stuff, is really good and, and fits appropriately. What I feel doesn't fit is like when we're fighting towards the end and there's like that epic stuff, and I'm just like, whatever. And then the credits, which you know, some people liked, some people didn't like, as far as what I, I saw. Um, I think it's a little bit over the top kind of hits you in the in the head I'm gonna get a bunch of texts now apparently um what else uh the uh live action stuff even though I didn't like it I feel like it doesn't fit in the game world um it looked good it looked good the acting seemed to be to be done well uh there were costumes those seemed to be okay um, it's just kind of like all the pieces individually were good it's just how they were put together that I think was the big issue um, the story the story I feel is not great but uh, thinking more about this I feel like it's probably because of the length of the game itself playing through the game it almost feels like it should have been shorter or not feels like it should have been shorter feels like it was shorter and then they're like oh crap it's too short let's lengthen it i think that's why we got to hella's gate we did the two uh valraven and cert went through the gate we're going to hellheim right the mountain with like the dragon on top and uh when we get into the door all of a sudden we're in someplace else. I feel like we were probably supposed to be in the mountain at that point, but they were like, oh, this is way too short. So they added probably, presumably, I'm just going to guess, they added that um, questing for the sword stuff and uh, and and some of the puzzles and, and combat, and that kind of padded it out. The problem is it feels padded, right? Plus, even when it was still that long, 
I think they just had a ton of ideas with the story. Um, I mean, because the story originally started as her going on a quest to save, you know, Dillian's, Dillian's soul. And she's an unreliable narrator, so maybe she's got mental illness, maybe it's not actually real, maybe it's all in her head. Then we get to the end, and the story has changed from that into... Um, she has to presumably forgive herself for Dillian's death. She has to let him go. She has to... It, it's kind of weird because they pull the camera out at the end. And you can see her on top of Helheim with Hela's body next to her. And it's like, oh, so the gods are real. And then they basically tell us that she's not cursed, i.e. she's not mentally ill. It's actually she was gaslighted or lied to by her uh, by her dad. I'm just going to cover my phone a little bit because that's a little distracting. Um, <clears throat> and so it went from she has mental illness, she's an unreliable narrator to, oh no, she's not mentally ill, the gods are actually real. The, the change of story and I feel like that could have been I feel like that probably wasn't intentional but that's what I got out of it also it could have worked I think had they let it breathe a little bit which is why I feel the story even padded or the length of the game even padded was still too short that and some of the combat sections like the game the game itself doesn't let you breathe and consider you know, the events that have transpired. Um, a lot of people, some of the reviews I read, a lot of them were like, screw this walking simulator, blah, blah, blah. I honestly think it would have benefited more from being more like a walking simulator, but that's just me. I think the plot elements would have uh, been developed better or had a chance to develop more. But then there's issues... Um, with <clears throat> like Senwa looking into the camera which I feel was probably done because they are proud of the facial animations and stuff and they want to show it off and I don't have a problem with that but it like at the end where there's supposed to be she's looking at Hela but she's actually looking into the camera and we're sort of looking through Hela's eyes it doesn't work for me. There needs to be a moment between the two of them that we need to see them looking at each other so that we can be like, what's going to happen? What's going on? But instead, she's looking at us, and it's like, um, okay. So there were some, some missteps, I feel. But at the same time, part of it is them just, I think, the game originally was too short. They padded it out, and then they still had too many ideas and they were trying to shove as many into the game as they could um so that's that's kind of my my bare bones review there was a lot of like almost everything individually was great the story i'm kind of eh about but everything else was was pretty awesome um it's just how they assembled everything kind of took away from like the whole is less than the sum of its parts is how I feel. Additionally, I did watch the trailer for Hellblade 2, Senwa's Saga, and people that had shown me clips had mentioned that it was like, they're like, it's watching, it's like watching a Slipknot music video. It actually is a music video. I mean, kind of. The music that's playing is a Highlang or something like that. It's some actual band I think maybe a metal band presumably but um and the the trailer shows Senwa in like this this face paint but more with like runes and stuff all over her face like she's an actual shaman and then the whole thing is like some kind of weird ritual and there's like magic lines that start appearing on the earth around the village like she's actually summoning something and so it kind of lends 
credence to my theory that everything is actually real, right? The gods are real, all that stuff. Now, apparently, and we'll probably see this in the feature, uh, before it was released, the, or maybe right after, the developers were saying that they wanted the end to be ambivalent. And they wanted Senwa saying, follow me on my other story, or there's still another story to tell. They weren't planning, apparently, they were not planning on making a sequel at that point. It was more like either she has more stories in her, or she has more adventures, or I think more specifically they said it was more like her accepting Dillian's death and, and moving on and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's that's kind of interesting that they basically that was their intent and then they're like oh no we, we want to we want to make a sequel so we'll just turn that into a sequel hook instead. So it's hit or miss. Anyway uh, it's it's been about 11 minutes since I started. Hopefully the pseudo review was okay. Um, I mean obviously I welcome any comments or criticisms or anything you guys have. Let's uh, let's watch the feature because I don't always try and get every single bit out of the games that I play, but I'm a big fan of uh, like developer developer commentary and stuff. So that's that's something that I'm I'm really interested in. You know the reasoning behind what they made, how they made it, why they made it a certain way. Um, oh, also, the, the mental illness, something that I wanted to talk about real fast. Um, I do think in the game, they were... They put a lot of that stuff in there, I think, because it's cool, right? Um, good imagery and stuff. There's maybe nothing wrong with that, uh, because it does prompt, like I said, the discussion about mental health and mental illness and, and possible cures. Now, something that I did want to point out, though, is that even though I feel like they probably did it because it's cool, I don't think they were being disrespectful. It, it does feel like, even though they were kind of clumsy with the issue, um, it does feel like they're treating it in a very sensitive fashion, as sensitive as they can, right? So... You know, make of that what you will. Um, I think we're going to see more of this in the Hellblade feature. So I will basically shut up probably during most of it unless I feel I have something important to add. Um, hopefully not because I know this is about 20 minutes and I don't want to hit I don't want to hit the hour mark, but we'll see. We'll see. So anyway, let's uh, let's watch this feature. And if you're going to cut off here, then thank you guys so much for your time and attention. Okay, following feature contains spoilers. Stormy seas and lost souls. Who is it? She's dreamt of this before. It's coming. Is it? Is it? They say dreams are visions of our memories, thoughts, and fears. As seen by our inner eyes. Oh, what if each one of us is always dreaming? even when awake. And we only see what our inner eye creates for us. Is this what hell is? A world shaped by Senua's nightmares? Maybe that's why people fear seeing the world through our eyes. Because if you believe that Senua's reality is twisted, let me just pause for a second. Also, the uh, permadeath thing. I looked that up as well. It doesn't actually erase your save file and send you to the beginning. It just doesn't, apparently. So, there you go. You must accept that yours might be too. I mean, there's a lot of interesting set pieces, right? Is that my pointer? How can you see it, but I can't? Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is a video game about Senua, a Celtic warrior on a vision quest into Viking territory. But what sets our hero Senua apart is that she suffers from severe psychotic mental illness. Does she? Oh, 
The original idea for Hellblade was to create a classic hero's journey, a journey of suffering, but one where the fantasy world is not another planet or alternate universe, but a world that is constructed in Senua's mind. But to do so would mean putting psychotic mental illness at the center of the experience, a subject that is still considered taboo, and a challenge that was both terrifying and exciting in equal measure. In Hellblade, the starting point was a newly discovered Celtic goddess called Senuna in Ashwell, Hertfordshire. When first discovered, her name was thought to be Senua, a name which I liked and kept. Mm. I wondered if Senua might have been a Celtic warrior like Boudicca, who stood up to the Romans. While the Romans had conquered all of Europe, there was a group of Celts up in the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire that could not be conquered, the Picts. And so the Romans built a wall, called Hadrian's Wall, that spans across Britain from sea to sea to keep the Pictish barbarians at bay. That's awesome. The Picts were known for their wall paint, painted on with woad, and their matted hair clumped with lime. And so Senua would be a barbarian Pict in this image. What's your name? Senua. I haven't seen you before. I don't live home much. Oh, Zeno's daughter. I have to go. Wait! Orkney is off the coast of Scotland and was inhabited by the Picts, steeped in history and mystery. And so I made Orkney Senua's home and set the stage for a crisis. In the late 8th century, the first Vikings landed on the Orkney Islands. The population of the Picts crashed thereafter, replaced by the Norsemen of the 9th century. Were they wiped out? We don't know for sure, but it would seem likely given the reputation of the Vikings. The Northmen's brutality is legendary. High-ranking leaders and chieftains of the tribes they conquered were often offered as sacrifice to their gods. The most brutal of these sacrifices was known as the Blood Eagle. I imagine Senua as a young female warrior who returns home from exile to find her partner, Dilia, brutally sacrificed to a Norse god by these hellish warriors from a faraway land. I imagine the horror of this moment and how it would have dragged her deep into mental torment. It sounds like this is his baby. You know, like he envisioned all this stuff and he's like, let's... These are the ideas. I came to learn that the Celts had a sophisticated and nuanced perspective on the nature of mental disorder. One term they used was gelt. A gelt is a man or woman who has been driven mad by a curse, battle trauma or grief. The Gelt would take to a life in the woods in search of penance, punishment, and purgation. And so Senua became a Gelt, cursed by darkness, looking for redemption in the wilds. <coughs> Another word the Celts used in reference to mental disorders was truth, meaning fool, or Liar. one who utters the words of God. They tell of the mad sinner who flees battle into exile and takes on a beastly nature, growing feathers on his body. The character called Truth in Hellblade is based on a little-known person called Findan, an 8th century Irish Celt who was captured and enslaved by the Vikings, but eventually escaped to Orkney where he became a monk. I will tell you my stories of hell, if I may walk with you. Upon meeting Senua, it would be his stories that fuel her quest deep into their world of gods. The Northmen say the world will come to an end. The sun will grow black, the earth will sink into the sea, the stars will disappear, fire and water will meet. I understand that's the point, but I don't think that's what they conveyed properly. That it was all... I think they're trying to convey that it's all in her head. I don't think that's what they actually did. So the stage was set for a new adventure, a journey into the Norse underworld called Hell, a vision quest fueled by madness and myth, a fantasy that was created by Senua's own mind, and one that we would experience through her eyes. This is your mission. This is your quest. There is nothing else left. 
To make a game about a warrior with psychotic mental illness as its central theme was fraught with danger. Mental illness such as psychosis is still taboo and rarely acknowledged in a century of cinema, never mind the new medium of games. Where it does feature, it often conflates psychosis and psychopathy associated with a lack of empathy. It is unfortunate that these two words sound so similar that they are used interchangeably in media. I must admit that I didn't have to look very far to discover my own ignorance of the subject. So we reached out to Paul Fletcher, psychiatrist and professor of health neuroscience at University of Cambridge. Psychosis is a descriptive term and it refers to um, having a loss of contact with objective reality. So it's characterized by uh, two main sets of symptoms. One of them is hallucinations where somebody experiences perceptions when there is no actual objective thing out there to perceive. And the other is delusions, where somebody comes to very often bizarre, unpleasant, frightening beliefs when there's no good evidence I in favour of them. There's no doubt about it. The source of the darkness is in Helheim. And the goddess Hela holds his soul there. We reached out to Welcome, a biomedical research charity that spends billions on research and awareness programmes aimed at improving health. Mental health hasn't always been presented in the media in a way that is particularly helpful. Um, it can be challenging to engage people with the subject matter and there are a lot of preconceived ideas about mental health and particularly schizophrenia and psychosis. So we hope our support allows the team to continue to collaborate with Paul Fletcher and with those who have experience of psychosis to create a game that provides a fresh perspective on the condition and allows audiences to engage with it in a way that just wouldn't be possible in any other medium. What started out as a brief. That's, yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I think that's something they were trying to go for, which is you as the player can experience psychosis. I mean, whether it actually achieved that I, is debatable. I don't really think so, but they tried, and that's worth something. So consultation convinced me that we were only scratching the surface of an immensely deep and interesting subject that could enrich and change the very nature of the game. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks. Uh, it's really interesting for me. I'd love to be involved. It's fascinating. Yeah. Our understanding of psychosis is still very much a mystery and ways of treating it are still primitive compared to physical illness. After all, it is easy to see the pain and suffering caused by physical diseases or physical trauma. It is not so easy to see the mental suffering and trauma of severe mental illness. But what if we could find a way to see it? Games are capable of drawing you in for hours on end, playing the role of a character who is different from you, experiencing their perspective, and actively involving you in a world that functions with a different set of rules. If we were to represent Senua Psychosis, we would have to simulate voice hearing, a common attribute. But how can we simulate something we have no first-hand experience of? Professor Charles Fernieho, a leading expert in voice hearing from Durham University, offered his help. Hearing voices is an experience that is usually associated with severe mental illness. And crucially, we know that hearing voices is a part of ordinary life for many people who don't meet the criteria for mental illness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's not him in real life. We know voices vary according to where they appear in space. Voices can appear far away in the distance, they can appear right there in your ear, they can seem to be coming from inside your head. Based on the information Professor Fernie Ho provided, I put together a sound brief and invited some actors to the studio. So that is um, something that I just wanted to just touch on real fast. They're using a binaural mic, which is like the thing with the ears. It's what a lot of, uh, a lot of YouTubers that do ASMR use. Um, now I have, the beginning of the game right it's got a little splash screen it talks about using headphones for the best sound um yes yes basically yes using headphones helps um because true binaural sound it can sound like it's behind you or around um i do have audio engineer speakers that were actually pretty cheap um but they're for audio engineering and so they do support uh binaural sound and actually sound way better than these headphones that i'm using the problem is even though they're on 
each side of me they can't properly convey uh uh like the physical location of the sound itself so I'll, I'll, you know i can hear like left channel right channel stuff um but i wouldn't be able to hear like voices behind me which the headphones support so if you are going to play the game by all means do it with headphones you know and if you do that asmr stuff or you like listening to it by all means maybe get a set of headphones as well because sometimes it can really help we recorded the actors using a binaural microphone which records the 3d spatial position of sound replicating the way sound is heard by human ears it gives you an incredible sense that the person you are listening to is right there beside you Rachel Waddingham from The Voice Collective came to our studio with two young voice heroes to speak to our team. We talked at length about their experiences and they listened to our tests, giving us feedback on how we could improve on it. That's awesome. It's very hard to represent what this experience is like, partly because it's such a personal, intense, emotional experience. It's testament to how Ninja Theory have been listening to what the researchers are saying, but also crucially listening to the experts by experience. What they've come up with is so compelling. It's by far the best representation I've heard of what these experiences are like. Other common attributes of psychosis are visions and flashbacks. We met with Recovery College East, who work with and care for people recovering from severe mental disorders. A group of service users gave us their first-hand account of what they experience. Sometimes when the, the vision or the, what we're seeing is too much, it becomes more difficult until eventually we practically don't see anything. The people we spoke to, the stories they told, were fascinating, harrowing and mind-boggling. The reality of what people experienced was vivid, far exceeding what I could possibly have imagined. We went away itching to represent some of these visions and flashbacks in the game. As we all know, my heart is so, love is so far away. Don't you know how There's my content ID for this video. <laughs> I could never know how you grow all these days are killing me. See, yeah like that oh okay i was i was thinking more like the uh the bridge sequences and stuff but okay i mean you know i i get it it's not um i i appreciate them trying to represent people's actual things in the game it's just it's just a question of whether it's um whether it fits the narrative you know that's whether it you know whether it works with the narrative or against it and you know you know it's it's Depends on what you think. Right, Jack? To refine our work, we can see. Oh, hang on. Just, uh, just real fast. It. <sighs> what kind of bothered me a little bit? So I watched the Hellblade 2 trailer, which is total CGI. Total CGI, right? And I mean, they're using the same technology they, they got with Senua, where it was like, you know, pretty good graphics of the teeth and facial animations and stuff like that. And it's mocap, though. It's motion capture done by an actual person, and then they're just modeling it. So it's not like... Um, I mean, I guess you got to give credit where credit's due. They didn't have to do that, but they're, you know... It's an actor doing it, and then it's just graphics over right uh but some of the comments were like i'm a huge fan of senua's blah 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 and this you know and it's only after two minutes i've never seen anything about it before and this is amazing and i'm just like 
So CG, two minutes of a CG trailer made you a fan of the previous game that you've never played. And it's just like, that's not what, I'm not gatekeeping. I don't care, but it's, it's like, look, I have a bridge to sell you. You know what I mean? It just, there, there's a reason, uh, you know, Star Citizen is still a thing. There's a reason No Man's Sky, which apparently is doing way better, but there's a reason the hype gets so high and it's because people are gullible i guess i i really don't want to believe that but maybe that's the case maybe people see something that impresses them and they're like oh it's the best thing ever it's like just just chill out just relax you don't need to you don't need to fall in love with a new thing every five minutes you know Maybe that's, you know, social media culture where everything is, you know, short attention span stuff. But I, I don't know, maybe. I mean, I'm not going to say that the first game wasn't good. It had a lot of good qualities and I appreciate what they're doing here. But just be cool. Be cool about it. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's it. We need to hold meetings with Recovery College East over the course of a year and a half showing them what we had achieved so far and refining the in-game representations based on their feedback. With their help, flashbacks, visions and changes in perception were woven into the story and gameplay of Senua. The students that are involved in this project are incredibly excited about being involved. They have described the experience as being important because it values their lived experience and shows that despite what we have been through, all of that experience becomes valid, that actually um, it's something that we should all be talking about. Agreed. The experiences described range from beautiful to frightening beyond comprehension. I heard of a girl who has to live with an angry voice screaming at her, slamming on her doors and walls 24 hours a day. I met someone who would often see hanging corpses in the room, so real that she would sometimes try to rescue them. The panic and fear that comes with such visions is entirely understandable and it can be a living horror for some. Worthless. Weak, pathetic, go on. Feel sorry for yourself, because there's no one left to do that for you. I was urged by one fellow that we should not shy away from showing this horror, and so I was perpetually torn in making Hellblade. Had we gone too far with our representations, or not far enough? Broke and left. Just like your sword. So she has a cut there. Is she cauterizing it? In some ways, voice hearing and visions were the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. There's another aspect of psychosis that is much harder to explain, but one that I think video games are uniquely able to represent, which are often called delusions. People begin to see patterns in the world. They begin to link things that most people wouldn't link. Most of the things that we might think would be coincidence or you know, not worth commenting on. Nevertheless, that might have a particular salience or importance for them. One individual described how everyday words, sounds, colours and objects were steeped in meaning to him, forming a strange and sinister puzzle that he was determined to solve but could not quite get to the bottom of. Kind of like the, um... This is going to sound bad. You know, there's like a beautiful mind where he's got to like, the hallucinations, the... The people that aren't there are like, there's a bomb that you need to go off and blah, blah, blah. And he's, so he's got the, the billboard, like the cork board with all the stuff on the wall. And uh, I think Always Sunny in Philadelphia did something like that as well. And you, you see it. You see the patterns, right? They, they post the newspaper articles and all the strings connecting them. And they're like, it's all connected. And it's kind of... That might be how we like how it actually is. You see people doing that stuff and you're like, holy shit. And to us, it, it does come across as insensitive because that's what we see from the outside. We can't experience what they're experiencing. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that they're able to put all this stuff in there. Like I didn't realize this was the, the basis for the uh, rune finding. Right. Um, I don't feel that it's particularly helpful in the game. 
Um, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, aha, crazy, right? Um, I almost like that could be almost be a game in itself, right? You're a detective or something like that, and then that's the whole unreliable narrator trope, right? You go through, you're trying to solve this murder, trying to stop the bomb or whatever, and then you get to the end, and oh, it's not real. None of it was real. You know, and so it's like, we see that. We have experienced that through media. Um, it's almost, like like I said, it's almost too much. They're trying to put too much stuff into the story. Uh, so it becomes it becomes really hard. They had... The, the dev team had some really hard choices about what to put in and, and what not to and, and how to best represent um, the mental illness and experiences that some of these people have experienced, right? And that's... I, I dig it. I, I really get engaged and invested in this. And that's, that's why I was so upset at the end when it's like well you know you're not you're not cursed right because she's talking about the guilt she's cursed she has mental illness and it's like no no you were just uh you know you were a disobedient child so i just i'm a narcissist and an asshole and i'm abusive as the dad i mean the dad is all those things and he's like yeah you know i killed your mom because uh you know he's like a a domestic abuser and yeah i killed your mom because you know she didn't listen to me and uh you weren't listening to me either so i said you were cursed and blah 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 and it kind of it takes away from this right i realize i'm holding my hands up here i'm like making all weird hand movements cuz i talk with my hands a lot but down here you can't really see them so here it's more i don't know anyway let's continue that's just just my thoughts you know they're talking about it's important to validate their experiences, yet I feel the ending kind of invalidated those experiences. But that's my, that's just me. There's people online, there's, despite, you know, the, you know, 5% negative reviews or whatever that this game got, um, it seems like there's still a lot of pretty heated debate. I'm, I'm really curious, like, how many people... Uh, gave it a positive review and didn't really think too deeply about it. And then, of course, a lot of the time is that this is incredibly unique. No, no issues with that. No qualms with that. I will freely admit this is super unique. It's not something that's really that's been done. And so because of that, a lot of reviewers and stuff are just like, oh, this it's amazing. It's unique. You know, that's that's what I'm looking for, too. I'm looking for unique and interesting stuff. Um, but they just get so enamored with it that they're just like, it's a gets a thumbs up 10 out of 10. But it's it's not. That's. That's the thing. You still got to be objective. You know, this does a lot of good things, but it it trips over its own feet a lot of the time as well. So. It's not just brain dysfunction. It's not. It's not like the system shut down. It's actually an incredibly creative process. The person creates a world populated with voices and phantasms and terrors, and they're completely immersed in it. They believe in it. We often invite people into the studio to play the game. In one of our playtests, they played through much of the game, making associations between runes, secret messages, and the threat of darkness that stalked them. Interesting. There are many things that happen in the world of Hellblade that make perfect sense within the context of Senua's mind. The dark rot that's killing her slowly. From oh, before I forget, there's also, they talked about finding patterns and stuff everywhere. And I want to say that's kind of what, potentially what I was doing, because I'm trying to, it's a mystery. I want to know where the, I want to know where the story is going. But also, um, searching for patterns and stuff is something that gamers do looking for patterns, solving puzzles, that sort of thing. Um, I, I do, I don't, I don't know this for certain, but I, I, I think it's highly likely that, uh, gamers are probably at the higher end of the intelligence spectrum, right? They're smarter than average. Um, but also that is where the smarter you are, the, 
in smart people, there is a greater likelihood of mental illness. That's just how it goes, you know? And so I wonder if there is some sort of connection between... Um, it's almost like alcoholism and depression, right? Where people that are alcoholics, it's the alcohol is like they're self-medicating to, to cope with their depression. I wonder if video games are similar. You know, people that have those kind of tendencies are seeking out the video games as a, as a form of, of self-medication. It's just a hypothesis. I have nothing to, to base it off of, aside from my own observations and deductions. So I could be wrong. Anyway. From within, the secret runes of the gods that block a path to Helheim, and strange associations that exist in the game to confuse you. To complete Senua's quest, you have to internalize and accept the logic and meaning behind these things to progress. Afterwards, they said that they didn't see much evidence of mental illness in the game. People with delusions of all sorts would argue the same thing, but they are not aware of their experience being abnormal in any way. I need your soul. It's important to me. Representing perception changes and thinking patterns within Hellblade gives us a set of symptoms common in psychosis. But people with lived experience were keen to emphasize another point, that it is wrong to define a person by their symptoms. True. Quite often, the illness comes not from the symptoms, but from the stigma, isolation, and mistreatment that comes about from the rest of society. And I, I mentioned that as well, right? Um, the, the girl that did the TED Talk about, it was only when uh, she heard voices and it was like, so-and-so has entered the room. Um, it was only after people started stigmatizing her that the voices changed to something sinister. It's because it's, we feel those voices. We don't hear them. They're um, with those people, right? With the people, people that hear the voices. I think it's just their subconscious uh, being vocalized internally like an echo, you know, in a weird way, um, where we feel them, they probably feel them too, but those feelings take a, the form of an auditory hallucination in addition. So, right. Is that an curse? What if they're right? I needed someone to portray Senua, someone who could believably internalize her suffering. Melina Jurgens, our video editor, had been a stand-in for Senua over a few months while we perfected our motion capture techniques. Without realizing it, she had already auditioned for the role, and I knew her well enough to know that I didn't have to teach her to act, but to relive her own internal pain. As often is the case, those who have suffered mental anguish are never far from us. So is she... The video on the left of those cameras in front of her is kind of weird, but... Maybe that's the point. That by creating a compelling and aspirational character in Senua who feels very much real, albeit in a fantasy setting, we can provide a lens into her reality, a different one to yours. And this is where storytelling comes into play. I imagined her life based on common threads in real people's lives. She was always prone to psychosis as a child. Her mother Galena also heard voices and had visions, so perhaps there was a genetic aspect. Right. Or perhaps it was cultural as she lived within a world without science of gods and a superstition as exemplified by her druid father Zimbal. Psychosis developed in her late teens to early twenties and was exasperated by stigma and isolation at the hands of the clansmen and her father. It's darkness. It's spreading. The trauma of seeing her lover Dillian sacrifice tips her over the edge, making her remodel her reality around a concept that connects everything. The darkness. So the question, is what Senua experiences real? Can only be answered by saying, yes, it is real. It is her reality. Sure. All of her suffering will have been for nothing. It's just a matter of time. Towards the end of the project, service users and professionals that had collaborated with us were invited to see the near final game. 
It was a chance to see if the game had reflected their views or if it had misrepresented them. For me, being involved in especially developing Senua's character has been really important and being able to bring in my perspective and, and what I see and what I hear and having that built into the game has been a real privilege. It's gritty. Before, um, this is this might be a little insensitive to say, but I've noticed they all seem to be they all seem to be of the same uh, body shape as in overweight middle-aged women. Um, there is some. It's not like ha ha look at the fat people, right? That's not what I'm saying. There's a link between mental issues like Alzheimer's dementia, stuff like that, associated with high sugar intake. Um, no one ever really talks about it, right? The sugar lobby is huge. Um, but it is, it is, there's, there's something there that bears more research, I think. There's, I don't remember all the details. It's just something I read a little bit on. Uh, but it, it has to do with the byproducts of the breaking down of the sugar, um, getting into your brain and staying there, and your body has a certain rate for clearing the byproducts out. Um, but if you're constantly ingesting sugar, it can't. And so over time, I don't know if it causes damage or if the stuff just stays there and changes stuff, um, but there is some sort of link between sugar consumption and Alzheimer's specifically, I think, but maybe dementia as well, at least in later life. Um, I don't know if it does. It's it's conceivable that it, there's a link throughout life and maybe people um, with some sort of like genetic uh, history, like a, a familial relation to mental illness, uh, they might be more susceptible to high sugars. Uh, and but but I don't know. It's it's something worth bearing into any future researchers out there or whatever. Um, I mean, there's probably an article that I just I don't read a lot of medical journal stuff. I, you know, I'm not a doctor, so it's more it's more an, an interest rather than required for my profession. But anyway, and it's meaty, and there are some tough subjects in there that are being tackled with honesty. <laughs> Right. They're treating it with respect, even though it's because it's cool. Mm. I was blown away by it today, absolutely blown away. It was just fantastic to get the opportunity to use our lived experience in a very creative way. There's nothing tokenistic about the work we've put in. It feels like we've, we've right. been listened to. Um, things have been taken on board and I think there was a lot of realism in the in the game itself and it feels very authentic. The help Blade will give people a good experience of what it's like to hear voices and, and have those experiences. I'm glad that um, the guys at Ninja Theory kind of asked us to come along and, and help help them build an experience that's positive when it comes out and get myself a copy and have a go. I mean, it's beautiful. The game is gorgeous. I think all the way through, I was really inspired by how the conversations have translated into the game in a way that I think I didn't imagine was possible. So wonderful, really wonderful. I'm out of coffee. I was half convinced that Dillian's skull wasn't going to be real. I really hope that others will follow the lead they've set and use the power of something like a video game to change people's perceptions, to increase understanding, and ultimately to make some of the stigma around voice hearing and other experiences go away. I, well, I mean, I don't think it ever will, first off, but... For me, it was really exciting. The, that, that fear, the fear of the unknown, like it's a primal fear, and you see someone behaving in a way that is not in line with how they 
with how you perceive that they should be behaving instantly unsettles people. And there's, that's just human, human nature. It's part of the survival instincts that we've developed throughout however long over the course of, you know, millions of years, right? So um, not that I'm saying it's good, but it's important to understand your own biases and stuff. It doesn't mean they're wrong either. There are people out there with mental illness that are incredibly unstable. Um, you know, and so it's important not to be ignorant, but it's also important to not judge, if that makes any sense. I mean, there's still people out there that are, you know, they're like, ah, ah, get away. And they're talking to people and then you go, hey, sir, are you okay? And they shank you or whatever. That can happen. And that's why we're afraid. But then there's people like probably the people that they're showing us, um, which may have come from really traumatic traumatic pasts. I don't know. I don't know what their history is. But but if they're more normalized or socialized or acclimated, um, then then yes. But the the point is, it's the point I'm making is not to judge or not to not judge. The point is to judge correctly. Because we're going to, whether we know that we're doing it or not, the question is, how do we do it appropriately? So how do we know that we need to be afraid or concerned about those people that could possibly be violent? But the people that aren't violent, that just need a hand or some understanding, how do we not lump those people in with the others? How do we separate them? How do we uh, evaluate people with, with mental illness and people that don't seem to be behaving according to what we perceive as our reality. And that's why education and stuff is important. So hopefully what I'm saying makes sense. I don't always make sense, but I hope that I am. See, um, something that I explore scientifically being represented so beautifully in a character who's trying to penetrate the the mysteries of the environment in which they've been placed with all of this strange uncertainty and noise and and conflicting information that they're getting i'm very excited by this way of trying to represent mental illness because i, th I think it actually might be offering us insights that we wouldn't get from you know, pure scientific explorations agreed giving us quite an empathic view of what it might be like I'm out of coffee. I don't know if I said that already. This has been with us for as long as we have been on this planet. But why? Why has an evolution stamped out this weakness from within our gene pool? It's not a weakness. I this question until I realized that the question had an inbuilt flaw. It assumes that being and thinking differently is a weakness. The only reason we have computers, spacecraft, medicine, poetry, art, and yes, even video games is because individuals were able to simulate new abstract realities in their minds and share them with the rest of us. We need people to be willing to see differently in order for us to progress and survive as society. And we need to be open to these new ways of seeing. And it is this spirit that motivated me to create Send the Story and share it with you. I mean, I'm not going to say that mental illness is like the next step of human evolution or something. It's, it's not, but I do think it is a... It's it's only a weakness, I suppose, if you make it one. If that makes sense, right? The um, it was like in a section of the plague where they're like, you can see patterns and stuff that other people can't. Ooh, man, allergies. Really super bad today. Um, but, uh, you know, it was like you knew the plague was coming, and, and I don't know if... I don't know if there's been situations like that where it's occurred, but conceivably, it's a new way of, of seeing things, and... Um, was it Howard Hude? Uh, Howard Hude. Howard Hughes... Um, like he was he was insane right suffered from mental illness of some kind but he was very successful created the 
was it wasn't the first airplane, but it was like the first modern propeller airplane or something. I don't I don't remember. I'm not super well versed on the history, but you know, it's all you know, things in moderation, right? You could be a little bit crazy, but being too crazy to where it affects you. It's like alcohol is good, but too much alcohol is bad. And I think there are useful, a little bit of the mental illness or whatever. <laughs> a little bit of that is, is good. It, it's creativity. But when you have a overabundance, uh, that's where it becomes a problem. Like I said, though, I don't know how to... I mean, I wouldn't call it a... I wouldn't call it a weakness. It's just an... You know... It's an over-exaggeration. It's an over-concentration of certain aspects, I suppose. And, and sometimes... You know, if you want creativity in the gene pool, then... You're going to have excessive amounts sometimes. You just can't do anything about that. Um, you you need <coughs> you need you know for the gene pool they're like why hasn't it been stamped out? It's like because you need the possibility of mutations to evolve, right? Evolution, we only see the ones that lived. There's all sorts of mutations that happen that end horribly. And it's the one that survives and, you know, drives forward. But it... Hold on back there. And it's also based on the environment, right? Surv if you fit the environment, then you're good. It's like the whole Darwinism with beaks and stuff, right? Uh, there was a drought on an island. He, he saw it over generations of birds there was a drought and so the birds that mutated to have thicker stubbier beaks that would let them crack the, the shells of the nuts they survived that's a benign mutation right like it's possible that in normal times those bills may be they weren't long enough and they couldn't get all the food that others would be able to and so they wouldn't have as much of a chance of breeding right but all of a sudden they were top dog because they could do something else something that none of the other birds could do all the other birds died because these were the only birds that were able to get the nuts but then in times of like lots of rain nuts were everywhere then it became the birds with like the really like thin needle like beaks that would proliferate and wipe out the others because of resources. So, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing. It's not just saying, hey, they're inferior. It's like they are a result of a system that allows for change and survival, right? It's, it's the same thing as, like, why are we afraid of them? It's because we understand that they're not seeing necessarily, they're not experiencing the same things that we are. And that makes... That changes the rules of stuff. It doesn't mean they're all violent. It doesn't mean whatever. But at the same time, it's important. You have to take a realistic approach. Like I said, you have to understand, hey... Some of them are violent. Some of them are incorrectable. But some are capable of beautiful things. Art, poetry, whatever. And some are just normal. You know? Maybe some people with mental illness will never contribute to art or, or science or anything. Maybe they'll just work at McDonald's or whatever and, and hold a job down and, you know, have a decent life. And that's okay. They don't... You know, as long as they live and are happy and don't hurt anyone, it's fine, right? 
So anyway, that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for your time and attention. I really do appreciate it. I enjoyed this little feature. I hope you guys did too. I hope I didn't ramble too much. Um, I need more coffee or maybe more water or alcohol or something. We'll see. Um, <sighs> mm, more coffee it is because of the yawn. Um, yeah. So anyway, what is your guys' unique positive moment for today? For me, I... I I have, like, red stuff on my hands and lips and stuff. I was eating a, uh... A dill pickle that had been soaked in... Kimoy? Chimay? Chimoy? It's like this red... Stuff. Basically, uh, sweet, sour... Like, sweet and sour sauce. Slash, hot Cheeto powder. It was... Sweet and sour and spicy and dill all at once. It was intense. So <laughs> that's my unique positive moment. Hopefully your guys is just as good, if not better, hopefully better. And I hope to see you guys next time. Until then, guys, take care.